teach me wrong. Seek the way, pilgrim strive, which is the way. My Jesus is Jesus coming, coming soon, morning or morning night, night or noon. Many will meet many many the doom. Thanks for sharing your time with us. We are got a blessed to have Buck Dozier with us today. Buck, good to have you back. You've been here, what, 20 times? At least. <laughs> Glad to have you here today, Buck. I appreciate you and respect you. And uh, you're a man who has a passion for our city. I don't understand it, but you've got a passion for our city. I grew yeah. up here, so <laughs> I, and uh, it's just something I, I really love the city and been around it uh, still in every nook and cranny uh, with the fire buffs, one of the organizations I'm part of. And so I get to go to every part of the city. I want to talk three areas today. If I, and we'll chase rabbits. We'll talk about anything you want to talk about. Is I, I want to spend a little time, and we've talked about this before, on the importance of the home. Because I have, we can't talk too much about that. <clears throat> and I want to talk about the government and the role of government. You're the one that helped me understand that uh, if the government didn't tax, they don't have money. And, and you know, I grew up in the United States knowing all this, but uh, uh, I, I, I have a better handle after you explain it. I want to talk about that a little bit. And, uh, and the role of churches. Uh, churches got to get out and get involved in our communities. Um, and I, was, I want to sort of work off those three areas. Let's talk about government, the role of government. How do you see the role of government? Well, I, I think it uh, was designed by God, home government and the church. I think government was designed to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil, as, as the scriptures say. That is to provide justice. I'm not so sure that government uh, is effective in handling social issues as a lot of people would like for it to be. <clears throat> I rode with a police officer recently, and uh, and it was a female officer, and we uh, I've ridden with him many times, and I was the fire chief, so I know all areas of Nashville. But we were in an area that uh, where families are not not big; they're 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 broken, they're they're fractured. Uh, a lot of children are born, but they're not. There's no fathers in those areas. I've known that all my life, but I, I had an eye-opening experience those eight hours. We didn't have any really exciting calls. We had uh, we did social work that evening, and she was excellent at it. And I left that eight hours uh, mad and sad, uh, mad at uh, government, who I think uh, who is keeping them entrenched in that system where the more children you have, uh, the more money you get. Uh, and then the other thing was <clears throat> I left uh, sad because of the children. Um, I was They're hurting, aren't they? I was a youth minister one time, and, and I have a special love for children. And, and I, it just broke my heart again to see children uh, in the environment they're in, the lack of fathers, uh, the lack of an intact, intact home, which I think is, is really sufficient for success in life. I was, I'm amazed at how the effect of a father not being in the home tears things down. I was watching television the other morning and <coughs> I'm going to start coughing, you're going to start talking. I was um, watching a program on Fox called Fox and Friends and they had Huckleberry on there. And they was talking about poverty. And man, he told I got the answer to poverty. And he said it so boldly that it kind of shocked the, the host. And he was talking about when the government got involved in welfare and made fathers move out. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. We'll drink some water. Mm. Well, and, and I'll pick up for you. The, the, uh, it's exactly right. And uh, it, it has caused the the uh, abandonment of, of <coughs> happy homes and, and intact homes, I think. Uh, uh, there's, there's a great term called social justice, and it's interpreted by many people different ways. And, but I, I don't think the savior of human beings in, in so many areas is, is government. I think government does well fighting fire. I think government does well uh, fixing streets. I think government does well in policing, I think that's that's what they should be doing. But when we get into the social issues, and I just was reading some articles about uh, when when uh, Johnson did the great um, uh, poverty great program. Saying, it? Yeah, the great yeah, you know those it didn't work. In fact, it got worse. 
And we have a whole lot of people who are, I think, uh, are, are compassionate people. They mean well. They want to help. But I don't think they understand human nature, and I don't think they understand the role of government. Uh, they, they assume government uh, uh, is supposed to do everything and, and is, the, is, is the highest of all institutions. I disagree with that. Uh, I think it has its place. Uh, defense, for, uh, you have to have, countries have to have their own defense uh, systems against foreigners who would do them harm and so forth. That's the role of government, but the role of government, uh, the way we're trying to even, I think, more so do it in America right now, is problematic for the family. God gave us a family first. Mm -hmm. Everybody's heard me say this a thousand times. He gave us the government to protect the family. He gave us the church to save the family, but the family's got a small group. Now, what Huckabee was talking about, Buck, was that the families, when they had the husband in the home, and they started a welfare system to take in the husband out of the home, they wouldn't pay if the husband was in the home, and now those families are in poverty. They are, and, and this is what I saw on the street. I've seen it when I was in government. I've seen it, uh, but it was brought home to me again. I don't know why all of a sudden, after all these years riding with this officer, all of a sudden my eyes were open again to, to our system in America that is, I think is uh, really harming people. Uh, you know, I think the churches need to do more. The churches need to to uh, take on families, they need, they need to get out in the community uh, away from just their own doors. Uh, I think, I know we just did a vision study for our church and and I'll be frank with you, we realized that we, we were, we've been doing a lot of good works, but it wasn't doing exactly what we think the Lord commissioned us to do. And, and we were in areas that I think that others can handle much better than us and so we now, are, as I said, it goes back to my coaching days. We kind of said to the congregation there, "This is a football. This is, this is where we start, gentlemen. Uh, this is what a football looks like. Now let's get. We'll do the plays and all that. Get back to the fundamentals again, and allowing all three of these institutions to do what I think God intended for them to do uh, initially." Can you just imagine and see the vision that if each family? If we go as family, as God's small group, if each family would adopt one family that needs help and work with that family, we could wipe out poverty in America in just a matter of hours. The statistics are there to prove that, and, and uh, I've seen those statistics, and I think, and I agree with you totally. Uh, the church needs to get involved. Human nature is, is I use the word peculiar, there are people, again, out there who are very compassionate who don't, I believe, understand human nature. There are some people who are honestly in need. Uh, they need food, they need clothing, they need some money and so forth. Then there are some lazy people. There the are people some are people. Crooks. They're, they're crooks. Yeah, junkies. They're, they're, they, are, they take advantage of people. And <clears throat> often government is abused by those people uh, who are uh, using the system uh, to get money, uh, law-abiding, uh, productive people in society are paying their way, and government somehow is transferring that money. Uh, and as well-meaning as it may be, it's not working. And remember, as they're transferring the money, uh, there's a whole bunch of that money they're taking out to uh, for the... Uh, program or for the people who are running the program, it never really gets to where it needs to be. What happens, I've noticed, and this is where the church has the edge, and this is why <clears> God's <throat> plan is supreme, and the non-believer doesn't recognize that God has the plan to solve the problem. And if you have the family adopting a family, then if, I'm, if I adopt a family and the family starts to do, using bad judgment, want to use their money for drugs, not taking care of their children properly and so forth, I can pull back. I can set boundaries on that one family. Government can't do that because government is bound by law to treat everybody alike. And so if the government, you can't put it on a piece of paper. And so if I can qualify, the government says I gotta have it. Whereas when we empower families to go minister to families, then you carry with it the force of saying, well, if you don't want to make good decisions, you're going to go hungry. When that works, that will work. 
And surprisingly, when they get a little hungry, how motivated they can get. When, it, when it's easy for them, when it's too easy for mm, them, that's right. it tends to lessen their will uh, as a human being, I think. And again, this business about uh, human nature and understanding human nature, there's a huge uh, political philosophies uh, that are they're in fighting with each other. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the understanding of what human nature is. And, and we use the word communism, socialism, those kind of words all the time in society. Uh, those systems have never worked, uh, ultimately, for the benefit of a human being. It sounds great. It sounds compassionate. It sounds wonderful. It sounds uh, like it's the thing to do. It doesn't work because uh, even in Jamestown, I was reading the other day, uh, uh, story of America and Jamestown and in Plymouth, they actually tried the one store. We all we're all going to work. We're all going to have one store. We're all going to eat out of the, you know. We'll all bring our food together. We'll all combine everything, and it it never worked because you had the guy who says, "No, I'm not working today. Or <laughs> I'm I'm not. You know, why should I work? You're give, you're going to give it to him anyway." Unfortunately, that's that's the bad side of human nature, but it's there. It has to be dealt with, and some, sometimes I think uh, government is not is not the savior for the, for the family. I was uh, Mayor Dean was on the program some time back, and he said there's things government can't do, and and he's right. There's things that government cannot do, and there's things that churches can't do, but there's things the family need. If we got a strong family, you got a strong church, you got a strong government. You break down the family. You break down the church, you break down the government. It goes back to the empowering the family to be a family. Well, again, I, th I think these institutions were, were came from a higher source than ourselves. I think that God gave them to us, and I think he gave them the primary uh, duties. And I think we've, we've crossed those duties a lot <clears throat> uh, in this society to where we're very confused. We're confused as a society, and... and, and Government cannot legislate against selfishness no. because selfishness is it's a control. I mean, it can it can manipulate any system you put out there. Uh, loving your neighbors yourself can manage selfishness, and it can it can discipline selfishness, and it can guide selfishness. And, and so, God God set up a role for Christ. He set up a role for the Holy Spirit. He had a role for Himself. He had a role for men. He has a role for women. God sets things in place. To function, and if we'll just do it God's way, we'll have a lot of success. I'm not sure when this program will air, but um, in a com couple of days it'll be Mother's Day, mm -hmm. and then we'll have Father's Day in a, co in a couple of months. Is that is are those days uh, gone? Are, are they not meaningful as they should be? Uh, with all this talk of families and and the type of families we should have, uh, there was a time in our country where we honestly honored fathers and mothers because they were the answer. The, the, the institution of the family, the fundamental institution of society, this is what's best for children. Uh, that's what our church is, is just said to, to everyone. Uh, we're going to help you. We're going to be the significant other. We'd like to, we want to be the significant other person, but we, we can't take mom and dad's place. And mom, dad, you have some responsibilities here. Uh, for the rearing of your children, spiritually and otherwise. I think as church leaders, we've got to, and I know at the inner city church, we've got to focus on, I mean, we've gotten people to the Lord. We've got them in the building. We've got them to where they can worship. They've got them to obey Christ. They, they're starting their Christian walk. Now what we're finding, Buck, and you'll testify to this, so many of them don't know how to have a healthy relationship right. because they didn't grow up in a healthy relationship. They've never seen it role modeled. And, I've noticed this, if my young men that grow up with a single mother, and as they grow up and become adults, they take on the role of a mother. They will feed the baby, they'll change the diapers, they'll do the laundry, but they won't go out and get a job and get this. Not just get a job, they won't get a job, but if they do get a job, they won't bring their money back to take care of their family. They want to spend it on themselves. We got a lot of work to do on how to build healthy relationships. Well, so true. And I was reading an article last night, and, and I, I can't re recall the magazine it was in, but uh, this young man, had uh, he was an athlete. He was on a pro team, uh, been in some trouble. And he said, point blank, his quote was, it was 
brought out in the article that uh, the gang had become his father, that he didn't grow up with a father, he didn't know uh, what a father was like, he didn't know what a family was like, and the gang became his, became his family. That's the reason gangs thrive. They are. They fill that void, and they are headed up by evil, and it destroys our children. And, and you know, and that's the reason our kids wind up going to prison, and it costs us. For the American taxpayer, somewhere we've got to get a grip on how much money we spend in to incarcerate people, when if we get in prevention and them never get there, we save millions and millions of dollars. When I was a youth, youth director years ago, uh, and I used to tell the parents uh, when I first met with them every year, I said, I'm not here to raise your children. I'm to be a significant other person. Now there are some children who gravitated toward you a little more because things were not good at home. Mom and Pop weren't getting along, or in some cases even abuse uh, by the father often, or stepfather in some cases. And so they would gravitate our way in, in so many instances. And that's, the church can help there, and, and, and government can help there in, in, in many ways too. But it, it cannot take the place of the institution of the home. It is the fundamental uh, element of, of uh, foundation of society. It's, and, and it grieves me in this country that we're try, re, trying to redefine it. Uh, we're, we've lessened its values in so many ways, and we, we just wring our hands all the time about what's going on morally, uh, the, the situation that children are getting into. And again, I think the lack of modeling, proper modeling, is causing uh, a, a great area, a, a great harm in this. One of the big mistakes educators probably have made is they think everything is in life is academic. Mm -hmm. And it is the example is the greatest teacher and, and academic supports the example, but academic does not control the example. The, the example is what is important. But it grieves me, uh, and, I, and I, <clears throat> I make a speech all the time in many places uh, uh, dealing with only hang real heroes on your wall. Yeah, I heard you make that 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and, and it still is probably more important today it is. than it was then because back then we had heroes that were, as I tell everybody, and this shows my age, but Roy Rogers was, was my hero. And, uh, you know, he never had to reload his gun when he was in a gunfight. He never lost his hat when he had to fight the bad guys. He, white hat, too. He had a white hat. And... Uh, so, I mean, and they had the great dog and, and the wonderful horse and always got the girl and, and so forth. But those, those, you know, it wasn't real, but for a young man who is not dealing with a lot of life at that time, but who's learning about life, those kinds of examples was, I think, absolutely paramount. Today, kids, they're growing up too quickly. They're seeing things, being involved in things, seeing things on TV that are adult stuff, and they don't need to be involved, or uh, that those kind of things don't need to be in their life at that at that age in their Takes life. Takes away their innocence. And and the type of heroes, uh, I, I, Sandra and I, when you when I was coaching, uh, were asked to keep a house, and uh, this couple was going to Florida, and we were going to keep it. So I went into this young man. I coached him. I went into his room, and if. If he wanted to be like the people that he had on his wall, the posters, the memorabilia, and so forth, I was concerned. Today, that young man is no longer a young man. He's on up there. He's just like the people that he associated himself with. And he never was able to grow out of those uh, of the heroes that he had chosen at an early age. They're... they're methods, their philosophies of life, their music, their words, their language. Uh, for a young man to be involved in that at that age, he never was able to, to get out of it. And he's been hampered all of his life because he didn't have the proper role models, didn't have the proper heroes early in his life. Our parents need to understand that, that children, and, and I think we probably understand it, but we don't get aggressive enforcing it. The decision, I tell my teenagers, the decisions they make between the age of 16, and I probably should back it up a little bit, but the decisions they make between 16 and 24 is going to affect how they spend the rest of their life. And they can live to be 80 years old. But if they make a wrong decision <coughs> at 16, the rest of their life is going to be in the tank. 
Well, one of the things that I've, I've really gotten concerned about over the last few years, I always dealt with uh, 13 through 18 year olds. And they're, if I had a specialty, they were, they, were, they were the specialty. The area now that I'm most concerned about is 19 through 24. Uh, I've all of a sudden realized that the decisions of marriage, uh, education, uh, often their, their theology, their, in terms of what they believe religiously and so forth, will be made in those years. Mm -hmm. And people know that. The people who have philosophies, they, they want to get at them at that age group. And I'm, and of course, they leave the house. Uh, parents don't have as much control as they once had. We understand that. The church doesn't have as much control over them as they did because they're off to another school or a different county or a state or whatever. But I'll tell you, uh, the social media now, to be able to stay with them through the Internet and so forth, uh, the youth ministers now uh, sometimes go and spend night hours on the, on the line with kids they had who were in college. I had one tell me that they were on line one night with three different kids, all having different problems. But it's, it's a blessing in one sense that we can still contact them now. We're going to have to use that medium, I think, even a greater way to, to because that's a critical time of their life. Uh, they don't know who they are. They're, they're feeling their oats. They're growing up. They're, you know. Insecure. And, insecure. Uh, think they know it all. And it's, it's so critical in that area. And I, and I always thought 7 through 12th was, but I almost believe that 19 through 24 may be uh, Here was my experience. Super critical. And based in my service when I was a military back when, and I came up with this, that if we want to save our children, we want to protect our children, we have to involve our children. We have to engage them. Because if we try to protect our children by isolating them from the real world, when they get away from us, they're going to go berserk. And I saw that coming into Saigon just over and over and over, and I've talked about it a lot on the show. But for the children whose parents had been there for them and allowed them to learn to make decisions while they was in the parents' <clears throat> care and then pick up the pieces and put them back together, they taught their children to set boundaries and to trust those boundaries. Those kids did great. Uh, you're on one of my themes, and, I, and we could probably should have talked the whole hour about this. Uh, I, if I had a kick that I'm on right now, it's about raising boys, how we're raising boys in this country. Uh, it's too easy for them. Uh, they're not prepared. That's right. They, uh, one of the things that I loved about coaching, I, I think the athletic field is one of the great teaching classrooms of the world. Uh, and, and, and football is especially that way because pain is involved. That, that <laughs> is, you, right you, you, you know, you, you, there's an element of, of, of that there. And I tell parents all the time, you know, don't pick them up every time they fall down. Uh, don't give them. If you've got it, don't give it to them. Make them earn it. I, uh, I just see this now, especially in males. They're not prepared to handle the world. Uh, my my ex-athletes always, when they see me, they always bug me about, are you hurt or are you hurting? Because uh, I used to say that all the time. I say it to my grandkids sometimes. Uh, if you're hurt, I'm trained to help help you. You lay there, we're going to do whatever is possible, whatever that is, uh, physically or whatever. If you're hurting, get back in the game. And One of the things that along that line is we do, and we've overprotected ourselves, I think. Now, boy, I'm going to set some mothers off here and some people. You go buy a little kid a bicycle, you can't get two miles an hour. He has put on all this headgear. He puts on all this stuff on his elbows. The kid's not going to get any scars. And you look back to your childhood, you got scars. <clears throat> and those scars were teaching tools to you. And, and I just think that we, we protect them, we isolate them, we protect them, we destroy them. And they're not able to handle life when it That's comes right. up. When, I, when they were on the 50-yard line and I would run them across the field in, in wind sprints after hard practice, and I would run them uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, if they were healthy, they didn't get hurt as much. Number two, uh, they uh, were able to play longer if we had to go longer to play. And I used to say sometimes to them when their tongues were hanging out, they thought they weren't going to. I was there one time. I thought, you know, I, I can't make it across the field again. I'm, 
my body I'm won't. I'm dying. I'm, I'm whatever. And I used to say sometime, or uh, if you think Coach Dozier is the worst thing ever going to happen to you, you got another thing coming. Mm-hmm. I can tell you, death, loss of children, divorce to some of those athletes who've loss written me job. have come back to me and said, you know what you said to me. Thank you for helping me get prepared for life. Uh, you helped me back then. I, I didn't like you then when you were making me do it, but now I understand. Men need to raise their sons. Absolutely. We ain't got but two minutes to go, but I've seen mama raise boys, and, and, and I grew up with a single mother. My father died, but he set the agenda for our home. And, man, I got scars. I got a lot of scars, but I learned off every one of them. It said, when they said, don't do so-and-so, and I went on and did it anyway, I got scars to prove that I got education. And men can raise boys because they won't protect them as much. Mamas are trying to protect them, and that's hurting our, that's hurting our culture, that's hurting our nation. Well, uh, bringing up boys, which is uh, part of uh, who, who, who did that uh, series, uh, it's a wonderful series, Dr. Uh, 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 go ahead. We yeah. have one minute. We yeah, have time I, I, to think. Yeah, Both of us have the senior minute. There's, the, there's, a, there's a great series out called Bringing Up Boys and Bringing Up Girls, too, because girls, we're making it too easy for kids, and they're not able to handle life. Because uh, life is tough sometimes. And if you've got some tough moments early in life, it makes it a lot easier to handle them later in life. Buck Dozier, I'm sure proud you came by and visited with us. Um, it's always good to talk to you. I appreciate what you do. Um, I appreciate your passion for our city and uh, and for the Lord's work in this city. You're a good man and you're a good friend. You've helped me a lot, and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for all you do. Thank Enjoyed you. it. Mamas, I want to invite you to come to Inner City Church. Bring your young ones over and let us help you train them to be the kind of people that God wants them to be and help you be the kind of mother that God wants you to be because God has given you a responsibility. He's given you a blessing to your children. Your children are a blessing. They're not a problem, they're a blessing. Sometimes you think they're a problem, but they're not. And, but God has a way for you to raise those kids and we want to help you at the Inner City Church. Thanks for tuning in, God bless. Buck. Sit the way pilgrims strive, Christians away. My Jesus is, Jesus coming, is coming soon, morning or morning night, or night or noon. noon. Many will Many meet will their doom. doom. Trumpets will Trumpets sound, will soon and, soon. and all of the all dead of shall, shall rise. Righteous me, righteous me, the sky. I'm going where no one dies, where no one dies, where no one dies. Which of us will soon see your happy forever. happy forevermore when we meet on that shore, shore free from all care. care, from care. care. Rising up Rising in, up in the, the sky, telling this, telling this world goodbye. goodbye. Home and we, Home we will fly, glory to share. Magic.